Good morning. I'm glad you could be with me today as we're in God's Word together in the Unfolding the Word ministry. As you know, if you've been with me, we're in the midst of an extended study of 1 John. We're now in the third chapter of 1 John. We've been looking at a portion of it talking to us about agape love, about Christ's example of what agape love is all about, and acting out of agape love toward brothers and sisters in need. Picking up our verse, our chapter here in verse 19, reading through to verse 21. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and assure our hearts before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we can have confidence before God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate fleshing out of what agape love is. 1 Corinthians 13 is all about agape love. That's the Greek word translated by love in the love chapter. Christ's example, as we see it in the Gospels, helps us to understand what agape love is really all about. We learn that God, in his great love for us, in Romans 5, 8, has poured his love out into our hearts when we turn to Christ as Savior. We have his agape within us. That agape, which has been poured into our hearts, if we are truly children of God now, will prompt us to do things. We can't prevent that prompting. It will prompt us to be selfless in dealings with others. Jesus Christ's ultimate expression of agape was seen, as we saw in a preceding verse, by laying down his life for us. And that is the essence of agape love, laying down our life for others. Not always giving up our physical life, but putting their needs above our own. That is at the heart of selfless love. The application of it in the preceding verses was this. When you or I, within the circle of our church or the circle of the Christians of which we know and are aware of their lives, if we encounter a, within that circle somebody who is going through difficult times and truly in material need, that agape love prompts us to respond and help such an individual. God moves within us through agape love, through the work of the Holy Spirit, to get us to want to respond to such an individual. We will feel that inner impulse. If we don't feel that inner impulse, then there's a question as to whether we really know Christ or not. But if we do know Christ as Savior, we will feel that because the com combination of the love that God has poured in us, agape love, and the prompting of the Holy Spirit will make us want to respond in a selfless manner to the person who's truly in need. But here's the thing about the Christian life. Even as redeemed children of God, we had no choice over the indwelling Holy Spirit's presence. <laughs> we had no choice over the agape love of God being poured into our heart. But we have a choice as to whether we're going to act on it or not. Uh, we can't resist the impulse to act, but we can resist acting. And so what we were saying is that the, the preceding verses say, how can we really... <laughs> Say we've got agape love if we close our hearts to the person in need. Because God says, no, you should be responding. We will feel the impulse, whether we like it or not. But we can resist acting on the impulse. The bridge to these verses today, verses 19 to 21, is this. If you or I, as a redeemed child of God, disobediently resist the prompting of agape to help a brother or sister in Christ, one of the consequences of that is we're going to feel guilty, condemning hearts. God's Holy Spirit will convict us of our rebelliousness, of our hardness, of our resistance to God's intention. We will struggle with a condemning heart. All children of God, those who have responded to the gospel, will feel at times condemning hearts. These verses tell us important things about that. <laughs> we can have a solution to a condemning heart. Earlier in 1 John, in the second chapter, we were learning about a number of tests to prove whether we know Christ or not. Two primary reasons for those tests in 1 John is that, number one, if somebody is not saved, has not really responded to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
they will realize that they've not done that and they don't have a new heart. Then they will bow the knee and repent and believe. Or the second outcome is that for the true believer, it will help them to gain an inner assurance that they actually are right with God and that they do know Christ as Savior. Those were the primary reasons for the tests in the second chapter of 1 John. However, there can also be a third outcome as we consider the nature of the tests, and that's the outcome that we're encountering here in the third chapter. It's possible for us to have a condemning heart, not because we're unsaved, but because we are saved. Now, why would we feel a condemning heart? Because as a redeemed child of God, a new creation, we know clearly how often we live short of what we know to be true. We live short even of what we're feeling ought to be done. We're receiving the impulse, in this case, of agape love, but the impulse of the moving of the Word of God within us, the moving of the Holy Spirit, and we don't always act on it. And when we don't act on it, that means we are being disobedient to the Lord. And the consequence of that is an inner conviction, our failure to act, our failure to do what God is calling for us to do, produces inner conviction and guilt. Now, the issue here, too, is that the enemy of our soul, Satan, knows that dynamic. He is aware of it. And therefore, he tries to use those times of guilt, those times of a guilty heart in the regenerate believer, in the one who is truly saved, to cause us to doubt our salvation. That's why, in earlier in 1 John, uh, the emphasis was, if you are sinning, acknowledge it, repent, confess your sin. We can find forgiveness. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sin and so forth. Much has been said to get us out of the funk, so to speak, to get us back into the right rolling and orientation. Satan will use our times of inner uncertainty doubt that arises out of conviction. And so now in these verses, we're having some insight into how to deal with a condemning heart, how to reassure our hearts when our hearts condemn us. That's certainly the way it puts it here. And our hearts will condemn us at times. God's great intention for us as his children, if we've responded to the gospel, is to have us know that we belong to the truth. Assurance is his great goal in the life of his children. He wants to reassure our hearts. Notice how he puts it. By this we know that we're of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. This word reassure, as the ESV translates it, is the Greek word patho, which means to calm, to pacify, to settle in the midst of an unsettled situation, to bring about a calmness to make the waves stop crashing. God wants us, you and I, to have calmed hearts. Isn't that a praise? God intends that we could have a solution to this inner sense of condemnation. And all of us need a reassured heart at times because all of us still stumble at times. All of us still fail God's intentions at times, and that unsettles us as it ought to. God intends conviction in the life of the believer, but he wants that conviction to lead us back into settled times because we act on the conviction properly. He is not trying to punish us and make us stay in waves crashing around us all the time. He wants us back to reassurance, but we move toward reassurance when we act on it appropriately, the reasons for the, for the conviction in the first place are addressed. We repent and do the thing that God calls for us to do. When we know that we failed God, we feel sad as redeemed children of God. We feel discouraged out of it. We feel ashamed. Isn't that true in your life? And we feel unworthy of being his children. All of that, combined with the work of Satan, our enemy, 
combines together to make us wonder, do we really know him after all? Are we really saved after all? And Satan fans it into flame. He wants us unsettled. He wants us tossed about by every wind. He wants us to not be reassured. Isn't it wonderful? God wants us reassured. Well, join me tomorrow as we continue to look at these verses and discover how a reassured heart is achieved, how God calls for us to find the calming of a condemning heart. God bless.